I love the Lord because He has heard my voice and my supplications. Wow, that says a lot, doesn't it? I love the Lord because He has heard my voice. Because He's inclined His ear to me, therefore I will call upon Him as long as I live. Amen. The pains of death surrounded me and the pains of Sheol laid hold of me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. Take note of that. That's a recurring theme in this song. I called upon the name of the Lord. I called upon the name of the Lord. Oh Lord, I implore you, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. I was brought low, and He saved me. Return to your rest, O oh my soul, for the Lord has dealt bountifully with you. Amen. For you have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from fail or falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. Thank God for that. I believe, therefore I spoke. I am greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all His people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O oh Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your main servant. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise, praise the Lord. Lord. Hallelujah. This past week, Kathy and I were in a minister's retreat. And of course, uh, when, when my routine gets messed up, I guess that comes with age, maybe. <laughs> you get locked into routines and you know, get regimented and that sort of thing. So it kind of threw me off. And so, so as I was trying to deal with fitting devotional time in that and and uh, also to, to think about what the Lord would have me to minister uh, to you today. Uh, just in my regular devotional time, I was reading in Psalm 116. And boy, did it sing to me. And um, it just really touched my heart. And it really ministered to me. And so I'm just ministering to you this morning out of the overflow of what the Lord has been speaking to my heart. As we read this, once again, we're not sure who wrote this. We do know that this would have been a song that Jesus and His disciples would have been singing on that last night, that night that He was betrayed. Uh, there, that Passover uh, meal, they would have sang this song, this song, this song of thanksgiving. We don't know who wrote it or what the circumstances are. That's always kind of nice when we know uh, what the circumstances are behind the song. But clearly, this is a fellow had some troubles. This is a fellow that had some difficulties. And out of that, he, he, he writes out of experience with the Lord. And so this morning, I think we can learn a lot from this. First of all, uh, let me just say this. I believe that a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God, should bring us into salvation and deliverance. Our lives should be different because we know the Lord. Because we have a, a, a personal, intimate relationship with the Creator. Amen. We should have lives that are much different uh, than if we didn't. Amen. 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 Uh, I was on Apple's call one time and we were running down the road wide open, sirens going and lights going and all of that kind of stuff. And... and uh, um, my partner was driving, and of course it was something terrible, of course, that we're on our way to, and and um, and my partner was a little nervous and kind of worked up about it, and, and I said, it'll be all right, man, we good. He said, yeah, but 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 I'm, I'm not like you. you. You've got the Lord. You've got something to, to help. Amen. And I thought, wow, man, what a testimony that is. Yeah. <laughs> but that should be the way our lives are. Yeah. We should be different, and, and people should know that we're different. Now, we're not going to be perfect, certainly. But 
Our lives should be lives marked by peace yes. and joy Amen. and contentment. Amen. We should have lives that are marked by our relationship with the Lord. We are people who call upon the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow. You ever thought about that? How many times do you see that in the Scripture? Yes. Calling on the name of the Lord. And so this morning, that's what I want to talk to you about. Name is very important, of course, in Scripture. Uh, a person's name meant a lot. They would give people names and prophetically give them names. Sometimes it wasn't very nice names. Uh, but usually they would give, give somebody a name that was prophetic. And that name represented them. With God, it's the same way. The name of God represents Him. When we talk about the name of God, we're talking about who He is, what, what He is. It, it's that, that name is, is a great name because He's great. Amen. Amen. We, we bless the name because we're blessing the one who has that name. So name was very important. It, it, it implies a... When we talk about calling on the name of the Lord, what we're saying is we have a personal relationship with this one that we're calling on. The one we're speaking to. The one we're crying out to. We know Him. Back home we have this, we have make this, this statement sometimes. Somebody would say, well, oh Lord, you know how people just say, oh Lord, or oh my God, or something. And, and we would say, well you need to call on somebody you know. <laughs> you know, being smart. And mean at the same time. And also indicating we believe them to be heathens. But, but when we say we're calling on the name of the Lord, we're saying we know this, this, this God. We know Him. We have a personal relationship. We have an understanding of Him. Yes. Amen? We're on a first name basis. You ever heard that expression? We're on a, we're on a, a, a first name uh, base, uh, uh, basis with the Lord. And that's something we need to, we need to really learn to uh, appreciate this morning. That we know the Lord. When God called Moses at the burning bush, Moses said, well, who, do, who, who am I supposed to tell these people has sent me? What is your name? And didn't that know what he asked him? What's your name? And he said, my name is I am that I am. So you go tell them that the I am that I am has sent you. you Amen. Isn't that something? That's his name. That name, of course, uh, we understand from the Hebrew is Yahweh. Now, we've, we've made it Jehovah over the years because the Hebrews didn't put consonants in their, uh, 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 or no, they, 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 it had, had it where they didn't put vowels in there and you had to supply the vowels. And so you had to, you had to just kind of buy uh, implication. Uh, and so uh, because that didn't do that, because there's no vowels in it, just consonants, and then the Jews got so scared of the name, they stopped saying it. Did you know that? They, that a Jew wouldn't say the name because he was scared he would use it in vain. That's how, that's how much they respected the Lord. And they didn't say the name for so long, they forgot what the name was. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, we, we have uh, put our best folks on it and and we understand it to be Yahweh. Now, they said Jehovah for a long time, and that's okay too. We can say Jehovah. They said, what's his name? Remember when... Uh, well, let's just turn there. If you want to do a little Bible page flipping with me, we'll go to Exodus chapter 34. When Moses had another experience with the Lord. Exodus 34. And this is, a, this is a, another example of God revealing Himself. Remember I told you last week, the only revelation that will really matter in your life, in a human life, is a revelation that God gives. Amen. Amen. When we try to come up with our understanding of who God is, it's always messed up. So we need God to reveal Himself, and here He does it in an amazing way. We can start reading here, I guess, about verse... Oh, let's see here. Psalm, uh, Exodus 34, verse 5. Remember the, 
uh, Moses is on the mountain here. He's gone up there to receive those Ten Commandments. And it says, Now the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. He's saying, Moses, I'm in a personal relationship with you and I want you to proclaim my name. I want you to tell people who, are, who I am. And, and he goes on to, to give a, a, a very good description of who he is. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord or Yahweh, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. Amen. What he was getting, what Moses was getting here, is some fresh revelation of who he is. And I like that. He's merciful. And he's gracious. Hang on to that word gracious with me for a minute. Gracious. <coughs> Merciful and gracious. Long suffering. And abounding in goodness and truth. He's overflowing in goodness and truth. Amen. Now we need, a, we need an accurate revelation of who God is. We need an accurate understanding of who God is. How many knows the world's got a messed up understanding of God? Uh, listen, religious people often have a messed up understanding of God. When I say religious, I mean, you know, where it's gone into some negative ways. Okay, is that all right? Y'all understand that when I say religious? Sometimes people see God as, as some sort of, of uh, as, you know, real stern, kind of austere, sort of, uh, you know, judge kind of God. And, and so they're, they're so scared of him, they really won't have a lot to do with him other than to fuss at other people and tell them they're going to hell. Yeah. Religion makes people mean. Y'all seen that? Yeah. And so we, 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 need, to, we need to get a, a good uh, uh, understanding of who God is because knowing who God is, knowing the name of God will affect your response to God. You know why a lot of people run from God? They don't understand Him. That's right. They don't know He's merciful and gracious and long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth. They, they don't understand that. They don't know that. So they run from Him. They hide from Him. And so we need, to, we need to get a good understanding of who He is so that we can respond to Him properly in a way that's going to benefit us. Amen? So we see some things here in Psalm 116 that helps us this morning to understand who God is. Notice in verse 5 it says, Gracious is the Lord. Remember I told you to hang on to that word. Yes. Gracious is the Lord. And righteous. Yes, our God is merciful. But take note that God is gracious. You know, I, I've seen, I, I probably read through the Bible, I don't know how many times, but but I've seen that word gracious mean, but it never really stuck with me until I read some, uh, uh, some of the uh, writings of A.W. Tozer. And he really, really hammered on that one time about uh, in one of his books, at The Attributes of God. He, he hammers on that, how amazing it is that God is gracious. God is gracious. Now let's try to understand what that word means. And when we do, it helps us to understand a little bit more about who this God is. To be, if you were to look up gracious, or maybe listen to uh, Brother Webster as I say, to be gracious is to be polite, kind, and considerate. So if you were to just look at that word, uh, just look at it from the flesh, it means for somebody who's going to be, somebody who's polite, not rude. Somebody who is kind, not hard. Somebody who is considerate, who thinks about somebody else's needs or, or their feelings. It's to be, uh, to be gracious very often is going to be best manifested when somebody's in authority over someone else or in spite of how somebody might be treating you. It is to express grace. 
undeserved favor towards someone else. Somebody that's rude, impatient, or inconsiderate is the opposite of that. We probably all know somebody like that, and, and you look in the mirror and you probably see them from time to time. Amen. This really came uh, uh, to me, this really came to me as I was uh, uh, recently, uh, so I, I won't mention the circumstance because they might be watching and might figure out that I'm talking about them. It's nobody in this church and it ain't my wife. Okay? So, let's, so don't think like that. But a person that got close to me and they started, they, quite frankly, they were annoying me. Anybody ever got annoyed by somebody else? Yeah. Okay, all right, let's, let's, let's be honest here. And, and so this person just kind of annoyed me and aggravated me. He wouldn't stop talking and he went on and on and he kept going on and on. He was doing some other aggravating things too. And in my mind, I'm thinking, man, this, I couldn't get away from this dude. This dude's about to drive me crazy. You know, and, and, and you know, this guy was nothing, I mean, as far as I know, he was a believer, and, 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 and there wasn't anything uh, that I could say was wrong necessarily he was doing, other than he was just get he was just pressing me, he was testing me. Yes. And so I, I you know, in my mind I'm thinking, well, I've got to I gotta get I gotta get shit of this guy. I gotta move, I got to I gotta shut this guy off somehow, you know, from aggravating me and frustrating me. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Now are you being gracious? Okay, so, so I had to, you know, come into some practice here on what gracious means. And I had to, I had to take all of that aggravation and frustration and, and remove it from the way I was approaching this guy. Amen. Yes. Amen. And instead of kind of shunning him or shutting him out, I had to be, listen, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to, to be true to what God had done in me, listen, how many times do you think God get, gets aggravated at you? Yeah. Don't you annoy God sometimes, yeah. probably, with the way you act and, yeah. and the way you, you know. So, so we aggravate and annoy Him. Aren't you glad He's gracious? Yeah. And so I had a whole new approach to this guy. That, that frustration, aggravation, annoying, all of that just kind of melted away. And I kind of got a, an appreciation for this guy. I began to think about the good and positive things. And what this guy was doing and saying and how he was acting. And, and, and you understand? Graciousness is showing grace. It, it, grace being gracious is even when you've ever heard of a, 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 a gracious loser. You know, uh, you know sometimes uh, you, you, know, you watch the tennis match and, and, and the one guy, you know, he smashes his tennis racket. You ever seen that? Just smash it, you know. And, and and maybe fuss and yell and scream and carry on out like children and carry on, you know. Uh, uh, but then you see the guy, he runs over there and shakes the other guy's hand and acts, you know, actually, you know, is congratulating him. You know that it's sincere. He's being gracious. Yeah. Aren't you glad God is gracious? Yes. Amen. We get we give him every reason to want to just be done with us. Yes. To to just kind of shut us out. Well, I I I saved him. That's going to have to be the good it's going to get for him. Because I've not had enough of him. How many understand what graciousness means? God shows us grace. I'm glad he's kind to me. Even when I'm a dope. I'm glad that he is patient with me. Even when I test him. He's gracious. And he's righteous, we learn. Righteous. Now, what's righteous mean here? The, the Lord is righteous. Well, we understand God is holy. The number one thing that the Bible tells us about God. What, what, the, what description of God we find the most in the Word is that He's holy. That means He's absolutely morally pure. Amen? It's hard for me to even say He's holy because... Uh, he's holy, when I say that I mean He's holy in a way that quite frankly He is holiness. He, he is the fount of holiness. Yes. In other words, I'm so, I, I have trouble designating Him holy because I mean He is holiness. Mm -hmm. he, he is the one that is the standard of holiness. Mm -hmm. Amen? Yeah. He, who He is is what's right and wrong for us. If He says it's wrong, it's wrong. If he says it's right, well, it's right. Amen. Morally, he's pure. There's no corruption in him. 
He's completely pure. He's perfect in his morality. And he's the only one that is. Amen. He's the only one that is. So holiness is, is really what he is. Holiness is what he is in his character. His nature. Righteous means when he acts, it's always right. When we say the Lord is righteous, we're saying the Lord's right. The Lord is right. If he says something, is right. If he does something, it was the right thing to do. Amen. Amen. So when we say the Lord is righteous and we worship the righteous Father, uh, you know, what we're saying is you're right. You're always right. You never do wrong. You're perfect in every action you take. Every word you say, every action you take, it is perfect. Yes. And so you're right. God, you're right. Does anybody get that now? Yes. He's right. And you know what that also means? In every dealing with you, He's right. Amen. Sometimes I wonder why the Lord didn't do this and why the Lord didn't do that and you wish it was that way and, and, and all that. But you know, when we get to the end of the road and we stand before Him and, and, and we understand maybe our lives from that perspective, we're going to say, well, the Lord did me right all the way. You know, the devil one of these days is going to kneel before the Lord. Okay? And say, Lord, you never did me wrong. Amen. Amen. All of creation will one day have to bow that knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, 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 and this is just the way I see it. What they're saying is, you're right. You, you are right. You are right in dealing with me. Every way you dealt with me was right. I got no accusation against you. Even the devils will have to say that before a righteous holy God. Is this okay? Yes. He's righteous. And then, of course, we read that he's merciful. Woo, I'm glad you're merciful. Where would I be today if God was not merciful? I thought about it this way. God releases me from everything that would stand between me and him. He releases me. Everything that would condemn me, everything that would doom me to eternal judgment, he's washed away like it never happened. We've all done wrong. And we will do wrong again. But notice what it says in, in Psalm 103. But God will not always strive with us. You ever had a young man that just kept acting up and you kept and you finally just said, I can't keep on punishing this child. This child needs a break from that. You ever got to that place? Yes. Just, just give them a, I'm going to give them a break today because they're going to need it. I won't maybe give them a break tomorrow, but right now I'm going to take it easy on them. God bless him. He's not always going to strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us. I love this, I love this verse in Psalm 103. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. Amen. Wow. Because if he, if he did, I'm in big trouble, y'all. My life would be a mess. My life would be really, really uh, messed up if he dealt with me according to my sins and if he punished me according to my iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has He removed our transgressions from us. Now you can go north far enough that eventually you'll start going south. But if you start going east, you'll never go west. You'll always go east. And that's how far He's cast our sins uh, away from us. He's removed them, it says. He's removed our transgressions. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away sins. Aren't you glad He took them away? They're gone. One verse says he threw them behind his back. So if anybody wanted to get at my sins, I'd have to go through God. How many knows there ain't nobody getting between or getting by God? Amen? You tap out quick with the Lord. Say love. As a father pities his children, David says, so the Lord pities those who fear him. He treats me as a child. Sometimes I'm the 
unruly one, the rambunctious one. But he won't punish me. He's going to give me a break. Like you did with yours. For he knows our frame. He knows you better than you know yourself. When you're all puffed up with pride and you're going to do this and do that, the Lord says, yeah, well, let's, just, let's see how this train wreck ends. <laughs> For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. And like Isaiah, who found himself realizing he was undone in the presence of the Lord, he also trusted that Lord to put him back together again. And we know he'll do that too. So that tells us a lot about who he is. Aren't you glad that we know who this God is? Yeah. He's not the mean, weird, you know, bearded fellow that loves to judge folks that the religious crowd wants us to believe that he is. Or the world that don't know God from a house cat out there trying to tell us who God is. But we have an understanding based on his word, his self-revelation to us. Let's talk about what he does. When the psalmist said he called on the name of the Lord, the Lord responded. The Lord responded. He called on the name of the Lord and God came through for him. He was facing death apparently in some way. Some danger had come and God saved him or delivered him from it. He was brought low but he was lifted up. He thought it was over but God had other plans. Let me, let me say this. There are benefits for those who call on the name of the Lord. That's what David said in Psalm 103. Forget not all his benefits. I still have some fits about his benefits. I'm, I'm thankful. Now, now I, 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 I have three things here that I want to mention to you. First of all, uh, one of the benefits uh, the psalmist tells about, God heard him. God heard him. Now, you think of God. God has created all things and sustains all things by the uh, word of His power. I mean, uh, you'd think God's got a whole lot on His plate. You'd think God would be too big. Listen, there, there's what, seven plus billion people on this planet right now? That's a whole lot of people for God to be listening out for. But the Bible tells us here, the psalmist says, I called on the name of the Lord. He heard me. He heard my voice. And so I want to say this to you. He knows us. He knows you. He knows how many hairs are on your head. Without counting. He just knows. Some of us are helping him out by losing a lot of them. <laughs> but he knows. That's how, how intricately He knows your life. He knows you. What this tells me is that this psalmist, even in the Old Covenant, this psalmist had a personal experience with God. Yes. Amen. That's wonderful. That's great. That's terrific. We ought, to, we ought to shout this morning that we can have a personal relationship. We can have a personal experience with God. Amen. 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 And I am, I am mystical in my uh, uh, relationship to God. I am uh, charismatic and Pentecostal in my relationship with God. I, I like having personal experiences with God. Amen. I'm glad that God. This isn't some group policy thing. Amen. Uh, I, I heard a guy say one time, "Well, it, it's all about group. It's all about uh, you know corporate. You know, we're saved through being in the body of Christ, and you know, all that. And that that sounds good, but uh, and, and maybe it is to some extent. But I have a personal relationship. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Amen. I'm one of the whoever's. Yes. Amen. But he heard it." Well, listen, he wants a relationship with you, a personal relationship with you. He doesn't want you to just become religious in the sense that you feel like you go through this and go through that, and that's somehow you know checking off the boxes that pleases him. No, he wants you. He wants a personal relationship with you. When we call, he hears. He responds. 
When we cry out to Him, when we reach out to Him, He reaches out to us. Draw near to me, He says, and I'll draw near to you. God wants to be wanted. When we call, He hears. And He comes to us personally. So that's the first benefit. I'm thankful for that. I appreciate all y'all, but I need God. Okay. If I'm going to make it in life, I need a personal experience of the Lord from time to time. Amen. Amen. The second thing, he said he saved him from death. How many knows that all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Yes. How many knows that the punishment for sin is death? The wages of sin is death. We've all sinned. And we all are worthy of eternal judgment. But here's the good news. Remember our, remember our definition of righteousness. To be righteous is to be right. Okay? Well, we understand that with God without very little problem. But even though we're unrighteous, I want you to take note of what 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. So Jesus didn't know sin. He had no sin. No sin at all. Jesus was holy. He's God. Had the flesh. He had no sin even when He uh, walked uh, uh, the, uh, this earth. He was sinless. But the Bible says God, the Father, made Him to be sin for us. So when we see that picture of Christ on the cross in, in our minds, when we, when we understand and, and see that He's been beaten as Beard's been plucked out by the roots. He's had a, a crown of thorns thrust into his scalp. And, and, he's, and he's got all the stripes from the cat and nine tails all over his body. His organs laid open to where they can be seen. I mean, the blood. I mean, it's a terrible picture, y'all. But it's a picture of sin. It's the terribleness of sin. Say, I don't believe in hell. I don't believe God would send anybody to hell. But you know what I tell them? You don't understand how horrible sin is. Sin is horrible and terrible. To a holy God. The good news is he loves us so much that he was willing to take him who knew no sin and put sin on him. Your sin and my sin came on Jesus. But then let's finish this out now. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become, now get this, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Wow. See, here's what happens when we have that initial personal experience with God. He takes our sin. It's like, you know, you could, you could picture it like a garment. Our sin covered us. The, the guilt of it. The stink of it. The, the messed up part of sin. It covered us. It's like a stinky, stained, dirty, nasty garment that we were wearing. It's all we had. It's all we had. We knew we were naked. We had to cover ourselves. How many knows leaves don't, don't work? <laughs> Your works don't work. Your works don't work. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. And so what the Lord does for us at Calvary he took our old messed up sinfulness and guilt and He took that to Calvary and on Jesus, He took that righteousness from Him. The righteousness of God that was in Jesus. Remember? He's right. He's always right. God took His righteousness off of Jesus and then He says, if you'll take this I'll put yours on him. Wow. There's a, 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 an exchange that takes place. You and I become the righteousness of God in him. And so I'm, a, I'm, I'm given as a gift the gift of righteousness. I'm righteous this morning not because of my works, my leaves are no good, my, my rags are filthy. 
I've got to cast that aside. I've got to forget that somehow I can earn God's favor or I can make God like me. Or I, if I just do enough, if I get baptized right, if I, if I go to church enough, if I give the Lord enough money, He'll like me. It doesn't work that way. It's just I accept what He's done for me. You know, maybe I'm jumping ahead here. But you know what we want to do? We want to take something to Him. We want to say, oh, I've got something for you, God. I've got something for you, Lord. I know you're really going to like this and love this and, and this is going to be the thing that makes you really love me, Lord. But you know what the Lord wants to do? Not receive something from you. He don't need nothing. You know what the Lord wants to do? He wants to give you something. Say that. The Lord doesn't want you giving Him anything as much as He wants to give you something. I don't know about y'all, but that hit me like a pow, like a brick. A glory brick. Boom. Hallelujah. He wants to give me something. We want to bring Him some kind of clean, cleaned up life. Oh, I just, I, I, I just don't feel good in myself. I, I, you know, I don't feel worthy. Uh, I don't feel deserving. Uh, I messed up yesterday and I said something today I shouldn't have said. And, and, and you know what that does? It, it, it causes us to pull away from Him. Because we want to bring Him some kind of wonderful life that He's going to be greatly pleased with. You know what? Forget that. You're never going to be worthy. And you're never going to deserve anything from Him. We always fall short. But see, that don't matter. What matters is that if I... Listen, you know what He wants you to do? Come boldly to the throne of grace so that you might receive what's the first thing you get when you get there? Mercy. Mercy. Amen. So bring your messed up, broke up, disgusting life and that's where you're at. Whatever is going on, always go before Him boldly because you know He's gracious yeah. and you know He's righteous and you know He's merciful. You go to that throne of grace to receive mercy and the grace you need in your life at that moment. What I need is holiness. I go to the Lord and say, Lord, well, it's a mess and here it is, good and bad. I lay it at Your feet. And then, once again, it's what He wants to give me that matters. And what He gives me is mercy and grace and help and holiness and strength and power. Hallelujah. He gives me that overcoming ability. Hallelujah. But if I run from Him, like a lot of people do, or we try to, oh, 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 oh great and mighty God of creation, Thou art great. And, you know, we try to hide it in religious stuff. Just be honest with Him. Just go before Him. Bring it to Him. And say, Lord, I need something from you. Say, we want to give him the, hey, But he wants to give us something. Does that help anybody? Yes. Yes. Amen. We're trying to give something to him. He don't need it. What he wants is, is to give to you. And he saves us from death. Hallelujah. Everything that, everything that would condemn us has been removed. It's been washed away. And he's granted to us this amazing righteousness. I can say I am righteous. You know, I, I might have used this, this illustration, I'm not sure, but remember when Joseph brought his two sons to J uh, Jacob and, and he brought them to him for, for his blessing? I think it was of Ephraim and Manasseh. And I think Manasseh was the oldest, right? I, I, I don't remember. Uh, and so he, he, Joseph positions them. You know, Jacob couldn't see good. Remember that story? Yeah. And, and so he brings him up there and he, and he sets them there and, and, and he puts... The oldest one on the right hand side. I want to say it was Manasseh. Puts him on the right side so that his right hand, which was the hand of blessing, so he would get the, the firstborn blessing. And he, he positions Ephraim on the other side. If I got this mixed up, y'all correct me. I think you're right. Later, I think it is. So, all right. So, and he's got Ephraim on the left hand. So here's what Jacob does. He reverses it. And Joseph says, wait a minute now. You got this wrong. He says, no, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. All right, listen. Yeah. You and I have been positioned before the Father. Yes. It's us and it's Jesus. Amen. And what Jesus deserves, we get. And what we deserve, Jesus gets. 
Amen? Isn't that wonderful? Amen. He's given to us a wonderful exchange of blessing. All right, let me move along here quickly. He deals with us bountifully. Aren't you glad He does that? He deals with us bountifully. And that's really the point I was making just now about how He gives to us. And it's not about what we give to Him. It's what He wants to give to us. That's what makes the difference. So here's the question of this psalm that the psalmist asks basically to himself. What shall I render to the Lord for all His benefits? What shall I render to the Lord? Well, I've got a few things here. Four things, I believe. One is to love Him. God wants to be loved. That makes it very personal. He wants a personal relationship with you. Really and truly, all of this is about you and Him. And He wants you to love Him. He doesn't want you to, to just out of duty or obligation have anything to do with Him, but He wants you to have a personal relationship with Him. That's the beauty of our salvation. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is, He wants us to call upon Him. Yes. He wants communion with you. He wants to hear from you. Pour your heart out to the Lord. Talk to Him like you'd talk to another person. The thou's and the these and the and you know and sometimes you know uh, we can get so caught up in praying we forget we're supposed to be talking to the Lord. Amen. He wants to hear your voice. He wants you to hear His voice. The third thing is to He says to take the cup of salvation. Take the cup of salvation. The ultimate revelation of the name of God is in Jesus Christ. In Jesus. Yahweh saves. Jesus is a contracted, shortened way of saying Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh, my Savior. That's the ultimate revelation of the name is in the person of Jesus Christ. You're not going to find any other revelation of who God is, what He's like, and how to get to Him outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. Any church you go to that tells you different, run. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. And listen, no one comes to the Father except through Him. Because He's that revelation. He's the revelation of God. If you have some other revelation of who God is outside of Jesus, you got you got the wrong one. So we need to take the cup of salvation that we find in Jesus Christ. He's the God we can know. Knowing Jesus is eternal life. Amen. This is what the Scripture tells us, and it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be. Amen. For the same Lord is Lord of, of, of all and rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he talks about paying your vows. Did you read that? We, I think that's three times in that psalm. He talks about paying your vows. I'm glad we don't have to do that anymore. Now God wants you to be good to your work. Jesus said this, quit making all these vows about something and just let your yes be yes and your no be no. But here's what they would do. If they, if they were going to make a, a commitment, they'd make a vow. And you know, very often what they would do with God is they'd make a bargain with Him. If you'll do this, Lord, I'll do that. How many of you have heard people say things like that? And how many of you have seen those people usually are the ones that don't do what they said they would do if God was going to do for them? I've seen that time after time. And when people tell me stuff like that, I had a fellow come one time and went to high school with him. He called me, his wife had left him. No, he was boo-hoo and he cared on. If I'll turn my life over to the Lord, will he give me my wife back? I said, I can't make that promise to you. I don't know that he'll give you one. It doesn't matter whether he gives you uh, his, your wife back or not. You need to get right with the Lord or you're going to hell, friend. Amen. And I can tell you this, my brother. Uh, everybody I've ever, ever heard make a vow like that never followed up on what they said they did. So you, you're, you're better off. What's the Bible say? You're better off not making a vow. 
than to make one and not do it. There's a price to pay for uh, disrespecting the Lord by not doing what you say. But here's the good news. We don't have to bargain with God. We just have to trust Him. I trust His Word. I trust what He's promised me. I'm looking at His vow. I'm not putting it on me and what my vow can do. You don't get that. And here's the last thing. It says, offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. How many of you here this morning would say, I know that God has been good to me. Amen. Then you ought to be so thankful. Yes. You ought to thank Him all the time. Thank Him that you got your, that your, you got up out of your bed ought to cause you to give thanks to God. Amen. That you got breath to take. Amen. You ought to be thankful to God. Amen. That you've got strength to, to live. To, you know, you, you ought to be thankful. And most of all, you certainly ought to be thankful that He saved us. Amen. I still ain't got over Him saving me. Amen. It still makes me shout a little bit. And praise the Lord. And we'll sing to Him and give Him glory and give Him honor. And, 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 and so, so we need to offer the sacrifice. How many know sometimes we got to, it's got to be a sacrifice? Sometimes I don't want to praise the Lord. Sometimes I don't want to give Him thanksgiving. Sometimes I forget about all of that and I have to say, wait a minute now, Jesse. You need to make some time right now to give the Lord some praise. You need to give the Lord some thanksgiving right now. Tired, sweaty, whatever, occupied, busy, whatever's going on. I, 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 need, to, I need to make that sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord. Yes. Amen. Amen. Sometimes maybe you've got a lot going on in your life and the devil's pouring on. How many ever it feels like it's just getting poured on? It's just like it's just the devil's lined up devils. One takes his shot, then the next one takes his shot. And then, then you think you're through with him and there's one coming around behind him. And you feel low and you feel like you've forsaken. That's another good time to give a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord. Amen. You'll find your breakthrough very often will come in your thanksgiving. If you recognize His grace and His goodness in your life, you ought to be a thankful worshiper. It ought not be a chore to you to want to worship the Lord. It should be the highest ambition of your life to be thankful for what He's done for you. You will, listen, you will spend eternity thanking the Lord. Amen. You'll thank Him for saving you. You know, people, have, uh, I've shared this before. So, oh, now when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask the Lord why I did this. And I'm going to ask the Lord why I did that. I said, no, you're going to fall flat on your face and be thankful God to let you in. That's what you're going to do. <laughs> Amen. Yes. And you'll thank Him forever and forever. Yes. David says this in 2 Samuel 22 and 50. I'm quitting here so we can get to this communion. He says, therefore I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the Gentiles and sing praises to your name. I will sing praises to your name. Amen. And he'll do it in front of the, the Gentiles. We just as well say, I'm going to give thanks to you, Lord, and sing praises to your name right in the middle of these heathens i got to live with. Bless you. Amen. Right in the middle of heathens, right in the middle. And the, he, listen, he, he prepares a table for us. Remember, he's a giver. Yes. He prepares a table for us right in the presence of our enemies. Amen. 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 And so the devils can do their, their worst. But we're going to give him the praise and thanksgiving right in the middle of it. That usually runs him off. Matter of fact, the Bible says it shuts his mouth. Mm -hmm. Amen. The devil ain't going to hang around with a whole lot of praise going on. But now, if you're in the pity party, I told y'all before, uh, the only ones that really want to come to a pity party is devils. Yeah. We don't want to be in a pity party. We want to have a praise party. Amen. Amen. We need to have a praise party. Because you know who shows up for that? Angels. Yes. Amen. You'll draw the right people to you if you praise the Lord a lot. Now if you're complaining and griping, the Lord sends snakes. Did y'all ever read that? And, and, and for us it may not be physical snakes. God help us. But um, 
But it's going to be people that's going to not treat you right and treat you well. They'll, they'll come along and pat you on the back and tell you how sorry they are for you, but they're not really good friends sometimes. Right. you got to be careful. Thank God for His Word this morning. Aren't you glad that grass withers and the flower fades, but the Word of our God stands forever? Amen.